Good morning. Good morning. For our opening prayer this morning, we'll be praying responsibly the prayer that is printed on the first page of your bulletin. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Praise, Praise the Lord, Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Amen. We'll continue with our opening hymn, hymn 402, verses 1 through 3 in your red, red Lutheran hymnal. We begin our Savior's worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love Him and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from conception. In countless ways I have sinned against you, and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Lord, have mercy on
Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may boldly confess him to be the Christ, and steadfastly walk in the way that leads to life eternal. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture readings. Our Old Testament reading for this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 51. We read verses 1 through 6. A thread that, a common thread that's running through all of our readings today is the idea that everything that comes from man is really fallible and imperfect and unreliable oftentimes. Whereas what comes from God is perfect and is reliable and is the rock on which we build our faith. We see that today in Isaiah 51. <laughs> at the end, he points to the heavens and the earth and says, all these things will vanish up like smoke, but my word and my salvation shall remain. So we read from Isaiah 51. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving in this voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke, and the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. So far, God's holy word. Our gospel reading for this morning comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Continuing with this theme, then we see what comes from man's mouth. We see in the responses from what the people were saying Jesus was. And they were wrong. And they weren't very helpful responses either. Conversely, what Peter says does come from God, and that is the rock on which we are able to build. Jesus Christ and him crucified for sinners like us. And this knowledge comes from God alone. And so we can rely on it and know that it is true. We read from Matthew 16. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? 
Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it.
Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your fellow redeemed. The text for our meditation this morning comes from Romans chapter 11, verse 33, and we'll be reading through chapter 12, verse 8. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, every generation of Americans that has come to this country has its own special characteristics, something that sets it apart from the other generations. And we usually name these generations different things. You think about the GI generation, or the generations that lived through the World Wars and the Great Depression. During this time, these generations learned the necessity of self-sacrifice. And so some of the values that set this generation apart from others is the willingness to sacrifice, the willingness to lead, lead a meager or humble lifestyle, the desire for family life and community involvement. And the next generation that came along was the baby boomer generation. And it was kind of as a rebellion against the previous generations. They rejected, by and large, a lot of the ideals of their predecessors. Now it was more about self-improvement in finding your self-worth and self-fulfillment. For a lot of these reasons, the baby boomer generation was known as the me generation. Before you think I'm piling on here on anyone in particular, my generation, the millennial generation, we're often known as the me, me, me generation. Because this generation of young adults were often narcissistic. We put ourselves first and think very highly of our own opinions. And social media has kind of exacerbated this whole mindset of the me, me, me generation. But this me first attitude, it shows itself more in some generations than others, but it actually belongs to every single member of every single generation that's ever been on earth. The first members of the me generation, Adam and Eve. They stood there at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they sought their own self-improvement, thinking if they ate it, they would turn into gods themselves. And rather, listening to, rather than listening to what God said, they sought to do what was best for them in their minds. And every single child that has been born on earth since that time seeks to serve himself. This me-first mentality really plagues us all. So today, as we follow our text from Romans, we seek to transform ourselves from this me-first mentality 
to he first. And really it's something that we can't do ourselves. And we must be transformed by Jesus Christ himself. As we go from being misinformed to then being transformed through Christ's blood and then finally being conformed to God's holy will. May the Lord bless our study this morning. This me first mentality, it exists everywhere you see in the world, existing even in the Christian church. A lot of Christians, even ourselves, it's about what we do for God or how faithful we have been to God rather than the other way around. Verse 35 of our text says, Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? This is a rhetorical question. Who has given any gift to God? Well, no one is the correct answer. Because all things belong to God already. So how could we possibly give anything to God? As the next verse says, From him and through him and to him are all things. Maybe you're familiar with the idea of monks living in monasteries. The whole premise be behind monks it's called cloistering yourself. The whole premise behind monks cloistering themselves in monasteries is this idea that you can do some great acts of service towards God that'll be like a great gift to God, and you can earn for yourself favor from him for doing it. So, for example, God wants us to repent of our sins. And in the monastic life, they take this the next step. They say, not only will I repent of my sins, but I'll abuse myself and I'll beat myself and I'll make sure that I'm uncomfortable. And then God will really be pleased with what I'm doing for him. Or God warns us about the love of money. And so in monastic life, they take it the next step. They say, not only will I not love money, I won't own any money. Not only will I not have any money, but I won't have any possessions either. And there could be something good to that. But the problem is with their reasoning. They believe that if they're giving this to God, it's a gift that God willingly accepts and that he'll repay them in due kind. But that's not the case. Again, as verse 35 says, who has ever given a gift to God that he might be repaid? No one can. It's impossible. This idea of looking to what you have done for God and holding your own self up as an example for others of what to do for God, it's really the me first mentality. Another example of this me first mentality we see a lot in mainstream Christianity today. It's this idea that I have accepted God into my life, that I decide that God is my savior, that I am here to worship you, God. Again, that's the me first. All that is is a me first mentality being veiled in Christian terms to make it seem good. But you think about it on its surface. You have Jesus Christ, true God, coming in the flesh and humbling himself under the law, allowing himself to be crucified not only for our sins, but we're told in Scripture for the sins of the entire world. And sinful people like we are going to tell Jesus that we're the ones that allowed him to be our Savior? Now, yet again, this is the me first mentality. And Paul says in verse 3, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. When we do this, when we slip into this me mentality, it's really because we're misinformed, isn't it? We're misinformed about what God desires from us and misinformed about how we receive salvation. Now we need to be turned away from this me first and look to he first, Jesus Christ our Savior. A good example of this comes from our Old Testament reading from Isaiah 51. It was in verse 2. He said, Look to Abraham your father and Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him. 
that I might bless him and multiply him. He says, look to Abraham, look to Sarah. And at first it sounds like we're supposed to be turning our focus to them. But then as you read on, you see where the focus actually lies. It lies in God. Because God says, Abraham and Sarah, they were just regular sinful people. And yet, I blessed them. And through these regular, ordinary people, I was able to bless the entire world through the coming of the Savior. And so as we think about ourselves, let's put ourselves in Abraham and Sarah's shoes in this, pa in this passage. Consider yourself, how you were but one sinful human being. And yet think of how God blessed you and how God came to you in his word and planted faith in your heart and assured you of that salvation that he has won for you on the cross. As this is how we turn from the me to the he. And this is really a transformation taking place. It's described in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The Greek word here for transformed, it's the word, or it's the basis for our English word metamorphosis. So when you think of metamorphosis, a metamorphosis is like a supernatural occurrence where one thing turns from one type of thing to an entirely different sort of object. Maybe in high school or somewhere along the line, you read the short story Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. It's a story about a traveling salesman, and he's not very satisfied with his life. And he wakes up one morning, and he finds that he's no longer a, a person, he's no longer a traveling salesman, he's a giant beetle. Some supernatural occurrence happens, and I don't think we ever really find out why it happened. But it's a good example of what's going on with sinners like us. This supernatural change from one type of thing to a complete other type of thing. Or look at your bulletin. On the front we have a, a, beautiful, a beautiful butterfly, which weeks before this, it was likely a fat, furry caterpillar spinning a cocoon. And after it hid itself in its cocoon and it emerged a couple weeks later, it came out beautiful and graceful. Nothing like its original self. And we have undergone a similar metamorphosis, a similar complete change. For we were born in sin. We were completely stained with our sin our entire lives. And yet Jesus has turned each one of you from being a sinner to a saint. From being one who before God has no standing at all and is completely sinful and deserving of damnation. And then the metamorphosis took place. And now in God's eyes through Jesus Christ, his son, you are perfect. And before him, you are his own dear children not deserving of hell, but receiving heaven. So yes, a wonderful transformation has taken place for each of us. Now, this Greek word metamorphosis, it only occurs three places in the New Testament. It occurs here in our text. The other place, or the first place it occurs is in the Gospels, when Jesus stands on the mountain of transfiguration we're told he is transformed before his disciples, and his face shines bright like the sun, his clothes shine white like lightning. And on Monday, you might have been looking at the solar eclipse without glasses, or trying to anyways, and you can just imagine how bright and radiant God was in his glory on the mountain. So there we see a wonderful transformation taking place. But it's not limited to just Jesus. For in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we find this word again. It says, We all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into this same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of our Lord. 
So it says, we look in a mirror dimly, viewing God's glory. This is God's word. We gather around God's word and we're seeing his glory here today. And the effect of that word, working in our hearts, transforms us. So that no longer is that glory only Jesus's, but when God looks at us, he sees that same radiant glory of his son on each one of you as well. So yes, a wonderful transformation has taken place. We are now saints. We are God's holy children. And as such, what ought we to be doing? We should not be conformed to the world, not doing the things that the world says. Rather, let's look to what God says. Verses 6 through 8. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So as new creations in God's kingdom, how can you conform to his will? By using your gifts. If it's public speaking, by sharing God's word with one another. If it's not that, but other ways to serve, then by all means, serve. If it's giving offerings, then give generously. If it's exhorting one another, then continue to exhort and encourage one another through the grace of Jesus Christ, our Savior. As we've all been given gifts, haven't we? And wonderful opportunities to share God's grace with one another. Now sometimes when we are doing this, and when we are seeking to bring glory to God, sometimes that old Adam pops back up in our heads. And it tells us, oh, look how great you've been. Look how much money you gave this year. Look, you're the only one cleaning around here. You're the one who's been helping out at church the most. Look at you. That's the old Adam. That me first mentality popping up again. And so we need to learn, we need to hear what Jesus said to Peter from our gospel reading. He said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Those gifts which you have and which you're able to use, blessed are you for having them. Because God is the one who has given them to you. Because from him and through him and to him are all things, even your gifts. And not only your gifts, but also your faith. Blessed are you, because God has poured faith in his son, Jesus Christ, into each one of your hearts. Blessed are you, because when you stand before God on Judgment Day, he won't see your sinful flesh. He will see the radiant glory and perfection of of his own son. Yes, we are no longer a sinful group of me's. We no longer have to rely on our own individuality or finding our own way in life or fulfilling our best self because we have this perfect fulfillment in Christ alone. As verse 5 says, So we, though many, we are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. To him be glory forever. Amen. Please rise. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
seated for the next hymn, hymn 409, which will be followed immediately after by the offering in the offering hymn.
our general prayer this morning. Prayers have been requested on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ in Corpus Christi, uh, the Church of the Lutheran Confession, our synod. We do have a sister congregation in Corpus Christi, and uh, we're praying for them, obviously, as Hurricane Harvey is swept through there and as they seek to rebuild their lives after the destruction. Um, we'd also like to pray this morning for Eileen Keeney. She's a relative of a number of the members of our congregation. She found out recently that she has cancer and it's fairly widespread. Um, the doctors have given her about a year to live. So we will pray for her as well. Pray for the Lord's will to be done and for comfort for her and for her family. So let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, you revealed Jesus of Nazareth to be the Christ and your beloved Son. Bless the church that we always confess this, even in the midst of persecution and hostility. Do not let our faith grow faint, but renew our minds, that we be not conformed to this world. Help us to test what we see and hear, that we may discern your will and rejoice in all that is good and acceptable and perfect. Almighty God, we ask that you would grant health and wisdom to those in authority, that they may carry out their duties according to your will, protecting us from violence and evil and maintaining peace and righteousness. Let our land be filled with citizens who love you with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and who love their neighbors as themselves. God of Abraham, he was only one when you called him, but you blessed and multiplied him. So bless and multiply us with children. Protect mothers with child and equip fathers that they may lead and raise their households in the fear and love of you. And kind master, remember all who cry out to you in their time of need, particularly our brothers and sisters in Christ in Corpus Christi and our sister in Christ, Eileen Keeney, and her family. Grant each one of them your peace, your healing, and your comfort. And Lord, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, in whose name we also join together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. We'll close with the final two verses of hymn 402. <laughs> 